Hello everyone, my name is July, and this is going to be my live reading of the article that I've done for Crisis Issue 2. This is the Golf of Floor Experience by me. When asked to write an article of my experience at the Golf of Floor pop-up, I find myself still trying to figure out where the story should technically begin. Going to the LaFleur event was not planned out by any means. It was something that was brought to me in the spur of the moment, truly a blessing that I never expected. The cards were quite literally stacked against us once we began our drive. The cards consisted of sleep deprivation. Many of us did not sleep the night before amongst the rush of our personal preparations for the event. It was safe to say that we spent the majority of the night before digging through our closets for our best outfits to wear. Time, simply put it, we all live in Fresno, roughly a three to four hour drive away on a good day. From Malibu, California, where the floor was basically taking place. We had planned to wake up at 6 a.m. in order to hit the road around 7 a.m. to allow us time to make for the 11 a.m. event. But needless to say, none of us woke up 6 a.m. and we didn't hit the road collectively till nine. And if anyone has ever experienced driving on the I-5 freeway, very common to experience a traffic jam every couple of miles. The drive, needless to say, was not pee. The car troubles. So right I was about to leave, I thought it would be a good idea to check my vehicle's oil and water to make sure things went smoothly for the trip. Turns out the car was in a dire need of oil and the antifreeze, which meant I had to go to my dealership to buy the necessary fluids, which set me back an hour and or so from our departure, which was terrible by all means. And the drive. The drive, now I'm no stranger to LA traffic, but for some reason on the road that day, every damn driver was choosing violence. The amount of times I missed an exit due to a driver cutting me off in the lane was unreal. It frustrated me greatly mainly because the alternative exits that I had to take caused us to waste more and more time on the road. But now that that's all out of the way, hope you enjoy. Let's get into the big meat and potatoes of it. I've been on the freeway for about four hours now, I'm driving to some location in the hills of Malibu, California. Kid Cuddy playing full blast as my friend David reassures me that the drive is almost over, over and we'll be there with our toes out stutting on him. The feelings of stress and overwhelming frustration began to water down as the scenery of congested lanes and blinking hazard lights began to turn our roads leading into mountains and hills with views that give your imagination a slight taste of what's to come. It was a surreal moment knowing that we were in the home stretch of our journey, regardless of all the unfortunate time constraints that we experienced. We knew our misfortune would be worth it, and the one thing that cemented that feeling in us was seeing a small wooden sign colored Geneva blue with a large F at the base of the mountain road. As we followed this series of blue signs weaving through the tight and windy road, we eventually arrived at the entrance of a large wine vineyard. As we pulled up to the parking lot, the first thing our eyes began to feast upon was a line of all the white vintage Rolls Royce limousines standing idle as valets stood prepared to help the next crop of guests into their cabs. A woman flagged our car down asking if we were going to be drinking tonight. David and I exchanged a look of confusion for a brief moment. I didn't really know what kind of event it was. Yet after a moment, the woman realized we were out here. To, we weren't out here to go ham on some of the time's finest wines, and they showed us to our parking spot. Once we finally parked, it was like a great weight was lifted off the neck of, and shoulders. Serotonin began to flow as I began, made my way to the nearest restroom to change out of my driving clothes and into something more fitting for the occasion. And as always, every day is Fit Olympics. I wore my blue oversized Dogma collage patchwork, patchwork hoodie, my black Dogma Folk 97 carpenter pants with Boro carpenter panels, white Imran potato Gucci pattern socks, and my Skylight French Vanilla Bison Giannos. Man, I was looking like a gold medalist that day. I also wore my green tortoise lens golf shades from 2019, an enamel bead pendant from golf, my Butler peach pendant, and a black pearl necklace from Lucky Double Jewelry. Once David and I made our outfit changes, we eventually made our way to the valet check-in. We gave our names and we were led to the next available Rolls Royce limousine. Once we took our seats, our driver drove out of the lot and began driving us up the hill to the event. 
As we slowly made our way up, I asked the driver how his day had been and how it was driving this vintage gem of a vehicle. To much of my surprise, the driver did admit driving up the mountain road in the Rolls Royce isn't an easy task, mainly due to the immense weight of the vehicle, the vehicle's limited speed, and obvious lack of power steering. We went on to commend our driver and told him he was a Jew. During this conversation, I had realized that besides riding in a vintage gem of the whip, there were some recognizable gems parked alongside the winding road leading up the hill. All the vehicles we saw going up the mountain were pretty much vehicles that T, or at least I speculated to be owned by T. It's hard for me to recollect by memory the exact vehicles I saw, but some notable whips were T's rally cars, a blue and dark blue Lancia Delta Integral, I believe the blue Lancia was featured in the What's Your Name music video and the blue color of this video or vehicle is similar to the Geneva blue nail polish. The dark blue Lancia could have been green, maybe black. A pink Fiat Arbarth 131, most recognizable for its appearance in the first round of Call Me If You Get Lost album advertisements. I believe I saw a black Rolls Royce Phantom 2, but I most definitely saw the big body green Rolls Royce Cullinan parked at the entrance of where our cab was heading to drop us off. As our cab made its way into the stone turnabout, there stood a valet waiting to get the door for us as we arrived. I should probably mention all valets and store assistants were dressed in the floor from head to toe, and as David and I made our way out of the cab, we thanked our driver, and our door assistant, Isaac, opened the door and greeted us with a welcome to LaFleur. The LaFleur shop stood small, smack center in the middle of the event space. The structure of it was reminiscent of a clay adobe, yet instead of your usual shade of clay, red, beige, this adobe was Geneva blue, accented with round windows and topped off with a black lettered golf LaFleur sign. As I looked to my right, I saw Mitch and walked over to greet him and check to see how the he was after the drive. After a short exchange of words, I noticed someone approaching to my left, and to much of my surprise, it was the man of the hour himself. We shook hands and he thanked us for making the trek to experience what he had been working on for the past few years. After a few more words with T, I made my walk around the event area, getting a feel for everything. And I will say the atmosphere was invigorating. The LaFleur Adobe shop stood at the top of a small ridge amongst the open horizon of tree-covered hills and exposed stone mountains. The sun was bright and warm, yet the wind was constant, cool, and comfortable. I feel like those days where the sun is beating on your back, but you don't really care because the breeze is keeping you cozy. It was just a very good day. After basking in the sun, I made my way to the adobe to peek up at the upcoming LaFleur collection. The space was incredible. The interior walls and floor were wooden and unstained, which complemented the various shades of browns, oranges, and blues of the garments that hung on the racks. As I walked through, the first thing I noticed on the wall were leather loafers with a gold LaFleur buckle. The shoes look very similar to the dark Martin-esque shoes we've seen Tyler wear before in public, except these shoes seem to be an upcoming collaboration with Solovey. Next to the Solovar shoe display was something I didn't entirely expect to see. It was a display of a doll fully decked out in the floor. In the catalog, the doll was identified as Benjamin Blue. The doll was wearing a green LaFleur leopard print vest, rolled up khaki shorts, blue shoes, and had a golf LaFleur Ushanka the whole nine. Across from the accessory table was a display for the French Waltz fragrance and nail polish, which I would say a lot of guests spent their time browsing over. To the left of the fragrance and polish display was a series of the Globetrotter trunks, as well as the pink digital leopard suitcase. I will admit these trunks were a little too rich for my blood, but after reading the specifications and seeing the use of pebbled leathers, vulcanized materials, and 14 karat gold hardware, it's pretty easy to understand where the price point is coming from. I would safely identify the Globe Trotter trunks as the focal collaboration for this event, and to anyone who purchased a trunk or case from this collaboration, you're ballin', no kizzy. After some time, a store assistant walked over to me and helped me purchase a few items from the shop. I had picked out a khaki bucket hat, a LaFleur pin, a moleskin, moleskin notebook, 
a nail polish set, and a bottle of the French Waltz fragrance. After checking out, I was told to go and enjoy the event. While my items were getting prepared, it was this moment I decided to add enough time in the store stressing over things to buy. It went around the grounds with my camera catching moments. As I looped around the floor shop, I noticed my friends had gathered around this LaFleur bellboy statue that was holding two suitcases with the words LaFleur embossed on them. As I pulled out my camera to take a photo of the statue, I failed to realize that Mitch was exchanging words with Christian Clancy. And off to the side, out of your shot, was David exchanging words with Tyler. After introducing myself to Clancy, I had some time to mingle and ask some questions. And honestly, it was humbling to hear the conversation held between Clancy and Mitch, especially with the history of Clancy working as Tyler, the creator's manager, and Mitch having a hand in keeping the golf community updated with current events. We spoke about the trials and tribulations that Tyler and Clancy had faced in the early years of Odd Future, through the stages of golf wing, to the inevitable rise of golf with floor. I will be honest, it was surreal to, surreal to hear what Clancy had to say about this time working with Tyler. I'm sure those of you reading who have followed Tyler's career over the years have developed your own story arc of all the trials and tribulations he had faced as an artist. I know some of you reading may even feel proud as a fan to see how far Tyler has come, regardless of the barriers he had to break. To hear Clancy give us his perspective on the hard and beautiful times of his career hit home for me, mainly due to the fact that a lot of the emotions he expressed were collectively shared and understood and felt amongst Mitch and I. The only difference being that Clancy's perspective was solidified from years of being in the trenches of Tyler's career getting to hear what he had what he had to say humbled and enlightened my perspective the best way that i can describe the whole vibe of the conversation honestly felt like it was one of those nostalgic talks you have with your uncle at a family cookout after some time of mingling and taking photos i felt a tap on my shoulder and i turned around to see an assistant holding two cream colored bags containing my recently purchased items I shook his hand and thanked him and began to take another stroll around the area, taking photos and enjoying the atmosphere. At one point, I pretty much zenned out, frozen, looking towards the mountains in the distance. I suppose I was just having a moment to take in everything that was around me. I will be honest, I don't remember how long I clocked out from reality at that moment. But I snapped out of it when I heard someone ask, you good? It was right from behind me, and sure enough, entering my vision from my blind spot was Tyler walking up with his hand extended. I was a bit caught off guard, not going to lie, but I dapped Tyler up and assured him that I was fine and just enjoying the view. He then responded with an all right, baby girl, take it easy and enjoy yourself. And walked over to the group where my friends were mingling. I realize now that I didn't get to see as much of the event area around the floor shop as I would have liked. Yet at this point in the story, I only had about 30 minutes left before the last limousine arrived. And for the majority of the last 30 minutes, I spent walking around taking photos and mingling with the other guests at the event. I will say trying to recollect this whole trip has been a bittersweet experience. There are moments that I wish I could recollect from memory, but a lot of it is a blur besides from the core moments I expressed through the story you just read. Being someone who has been a fan since the Odd Future and Order Squad days of Tyler's career, LaFleur to me is the, in my opinion, is the biggest coming of age moment for Tyler as an artist. In terms of T cementing himself as someone who can hold the line on all fronts of the creative medium that myself and many others recognize, respect, and aspire to reach in our own creative echelons. At this point, I have nothing else to really say regarding my time at the LaFleur Hill. I want to also express my thanks and gratitude to Tyler for inviting us to experience the world and vision of LaFleur, who continued to prove to all of us that hard work, faith, and execution of an idea will lead to the success we envision for ourselves. Keep doing what you're doing, baby girl. The world is watching with proud eyes. Thank you to Tate for waiting patiently, patiently, and patiently for this story to be written and for allowing me to tell it on this edition of Crisis Volume 2 made it to the end of this story. Thank you for your time and thank you for your interest.